What up, everybody? Long time no see. This is Dominic Syracuse here. I want to start off with an apology. I know that we haven't uploaded anything in about two weeks, but I want to let you know it's because we have been going film crazy. We have been filming content for the channel like mad. We have been to multiple states. We've been collaborating with different YouTubers, which I'm super excited before. Super excited before, I said. That's fine. I mean, that's how excited I am, as I said before. We, we filmed live music. We filmed interviews with mental health professionals. And oh yeah, the second season of The Manifesto, which is even more bananas than the first. I can't wait for you to see all of it. I can't wait to start putting out brand new fresh content two, three, four times a week. So stay tuned for that. Thank you again for your patience and I promise you won't go so long without seeing me again. Thank you to everybody who reached out and asked if I was okay and when they were gonna see content again. I'm fine, thank you for your concern. Uh, and as always, we really appreciate you. This is all for you and if it wasn't because of you, none of this would be possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, today, I want to give you a very special episode of shit I learned in prison. If you're brand new to the channel or this is your first time seeing me at all, hi, welcome. I'm Dominic Syracuse and for the last five years, I've been using acting and improvisation techniques to teach cognitive behavioral intervention in maximum security prison. A long title, but it looks a little something like this. Let's start moving them like this, move like this, move like this, all right? But for today's episode, I actually wanted to take you inside the classroom and give you one of the lessons that I used to love to give when I was teaching inside of the jails. The best part of teaching for the company that I worked for was that they understood that a reason a lot of the members of the population we served didn't do well in school is because they didn't fit the mold of traditional schooling. So long as I hit the benchmark of curriculum for whatever I needed to talk about for the lesson, they let me choose whatever subject I wanted to teach on. And the coolest part was I got to teach it in whatever way I saw fit. I had creative freedom in that way. And if we're being real, most of my lectures could be summarized in one simple sentence. Acting is not a waste of time. <laughs> But when they told me that I had to teach a lesson for the arts curriculum on free thinking and innovation, I knew exactly the subject of that lesson. Now, if you're a fan of this channel, it's not hard to detect that I am a massive Jimi Hendrix fan. Not only do I reference him in the very first episode of Shit I Learned in Prison, I also have not one, but two posters of him on my wall, and I'm also wearing his shirt right now. <laughs> Okay. Now I could go on and on about why I think Jimi Hendrix is so amazing. And I will right now. He's a genius, flat out genius. If you play the guitar, you owe so much to Jimi Hendrix, even if you don't realize it. There are those that will debate that he's not the greatest of all time. They're wrong. But what I don't think you can debate is that he is the most innovative guitar player of all time. Here's what I mean. I first started playing guitar when I was 12 years old and my father told me that if I was gonna start playing the guitar, I had to listen to this guy from the 60s, Jimi Hendrix. So as a gift one year, he got me Jimi Hendrix's greatest hits. And when I listened to it, 
I was blown away at how versatile it was. There were songs that were as heavy as anything that I was listening to now. There were songs that were soulful. There were songs that were funky. There were songs that sounded like three or four guitar players were playing at once and it was all him. There were tracks where the guitar was getting played backwards. There were songs where the guitar sounded like an alien spaceship. There were songs that sounded like a guitar had never sounded before. And the most impactful song for me was him playing the national anthem at Woodstock. When I first heard that track, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I mean, the first half of it was recognizable. It was the national anthem. I'd heard that hundreds of times before. But then he started to make these weird noises halfway through the song. I didn't know if his guitar had broke or, or if the effects were overdriven in the amp. I wasn't sure what the hell was going on. And my dad must have seen the confusion in my face because he looked at me and said, those are the sounds of the bombs dropping. And I realized that during the portion of the song where it says, and the rocket's red glare, he started making the sounds of rockets in his guitar. The bombs bursting in air. It dawned on me that this was Woodstock. It was the epicenter of the peace and love movement and this was his way of protesting the Vietnam War. He was playing the national anthem and using the sounds of war to accentuate the song that we use for our American pride. It was nuts. He makes the sound of airplanes taking off and bombs being dropped and people screaming and things exploding like You have to understand, this was at a time before effects pedals. That means he was doing all of that with nothing but his guitar and the sound of the amp. It was unlike anything anybody did with the instrument before that point. And this was the subject of my class in prison. You see, much like the people who were incarcerated that I was teaching to, Jimi Hendrix never had any formal training on what he did. Most people, when they learn the guitar, learn classical theory, which is pretty much the discoveries made by Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. Essentially a bunch of old white dudes, no disrespect. But classical structure is very rigid and often takes a lot of discipline to learn. Jimi Hendrix never learned any of those things. And because of that, a lot of people hated on him for not being traditionally trained. But since he was never confined by the classical rules, he was able to rewrite the script and start doing his own thing. He was able to go against the convention that had been around for hundreds of years and start doing brand new things no one had ever heard or thought of before. And even though he was hated on in the time for not being trained the same way all the other musicians were, and though he was criticized at the time for not having the same traditional schooling as all of the other musicians of his era, his approach was so innovative, so cutting edge, that now those same colleges that teach the classical method also teach what's called Hendrixian method, which means he created and invented something new. Now you might ask, what does this have to do with prisoners? Well, what I would explain to them is that so often the system is set up in a way that if you follow the rules, you get rewarded. That's both with the political system and the scholastic system. Oftentimes people who excel in the traditional scholastic system only excel because they're following the rules the way they were told to and being rewarded as such. But 
Those that think outside of the box are rarely rewarded. In fact, many times they're punished. Now I have to make a disclaimer here. I am in no way advocating that people break the law to be innovative. What I am saying though, is that there's a common through line to anybody who's ever been an innovator that they've gone against the grain and have not conformed to the traditional way of thinking. I'm saying everyone from Da Vinci to Einstein to Steve Jobs. These are all people who went against the grain and challenged the zeitgeist and because they did, came up with something new that changed the game forever. None of these men were considered great students, but because they thought differently, there are now people who study them in schools. So my point to the guys was many of them might have been made to feel stupid in school when really they just thought differently than everybody else. And thinking differently is the mark of innovation. You got that light in you and you're afraid for them to reject it. So one day I'm giving that lesson in class talking about Jimi Hendrix and one of the guys says, man, Mr. D, you sure love Jimi Hendrix, don't you? And I stopped for a second and I said, you know what? In a funny way, Jimi Hendrix is the one who inspired me to start teaching in the jails. And they said, what? Well, tell us that story. I said, well, here's the funny thing. As I said before, I've been obsessed with Jimi Hendrix since I was 12 years old. I used to sit in my room and try to emulate his style of playing, whether it was Hard rock. I try to emulate his funky sound. I try to emulate his soulful sound. And my poor family had to listen to me noodle like crazy until four in the morning trying to shred like Hendrix. Hendrix never did that. Yeah, Hendrix never did that, sorry. It became my dream to be a guitar player. And I got these posters of Hendrix on the wall and I would look at them every day for inspiration. Throughout my teenage years, I imagined what it would be like to play like Hendrix and set my guitar on fire in a stadium or play with my teeth or between my legs and just be revered as one of the greatest of all time. You know, that's the funny thing about imagination. The word imagination actually means to picture oneself. So I guess in a way, I was imagining myself in those situations. But regardless, it was my motivation through high school to keep playing and keep practicing. And then as I got out of high school, life started to happen. I was in a band and we tried to make it big and ended up failing bigger. I found myself living on buses and making a bunch of bad choices with things like drugs. One of the less admirable examples Jimmy set as well. But no matter what, I'd always look to Jimi Hendrix and I'd say, when I grow up, I'm gonna be like that. One day, one day. And it got to a point where I had to get responsible, get my shit together. I started working a bunch of jobs to make ends meet. I went back to school found out I had a child on the way. And even though times were tough, before I'd go to bed, I'd look at these Jimi Hendrix posters and I'd go, one day, one day, I'm gonna do that. That's gonna be me. And then I remember one night after working my way through school and being a single father, I was losing inspiration. I was losing my drive to continue. I thought, when am I going to get rid of this dream? that I have. And I looked up at that poster and I said, one day I am gonna make it there. And then I realized, wait a minute, I was 28 years old at the time. Hendrix died when he was 27. I was older then than Hendrix ever lived to be. In fact, in that poster I was looking at, 
Hendrix was 25 years old. That means that he already accomplished all that stuff I looked up to him for at an age younger than I was at the time. And it was at that moment that I said, one day is gone. It's never gonna come unless I make it happen. So I said, I'm tired of working a bunch of odd jobs to make ends meet. I'm gonna start using my art to make a difference like Hendrix did. And I began the path of teaching acting in prison. So after I told the guys that story, that same guy who asked me about my love for Hendrix asked me another question. He said, so why'd you wait so long, D? And I reflected on it and the answer is fear. I was afraid that I couldn't make ends meet if I took the leap and actually pursued my dream. It was then that I realized that the very same imagination that was keeping me inspired was also holding me back. You see, instead of picturing myself on stage, I was picturing myself failing. I was picturing myself going broke and hungry with a child. I was picturing myself never making it to the goal that I once set in my head. And that scared the shit out of me. And so I never pursued it. So then one of the guys stood up and said, so you think all that anxiety was just in your head? And I stopped and I said, I think all anxiety is just in your head. You see, if imagination is to picture yourself, I think that anxiety is picturing yourself in the worst case scenario. And then another guy stood up and said, so what's picturing yourself in the best case scenario? And I said, I think we call that hope. So at this point, everybody's getting riled up in class. It would end up sparking a discussion that gave me the basis of all the work that I do for the rest of my life. And that is this. We realized that the number one factor keeping people from living their hopes, dreams, and goals is fear. And as Nelson Mandela said, you must make all of your decisions in hope, not fear. So if fear is picturing yourself in the worst case scenario, and hope is picturing yourself in the best case scenario, where do dreams and goals fall into that? So here is what I discovered in the middle of a conversation with 60 inmates in maximum security prison. Dreams are hope minus action. For years, it was my dream to use my art to change the world, but I never put it to action. Instead, I was actively avoiding my fears with every job I took and with every opportunity I turned down to pursue my art. I wasn't putting any action towards my actual dream. That's why dreams can exist in our most inactive state, when we're sleeping. But then we realized that a goal is a hope plus action. When you set a goal for yourself, you take that dream that you have in your head that inspires you every morning when you wake up, that you can't get out of your brain every single day of your life, and then you make a battle plan to make it so. The day I looked at that Jimi Hendrix poster and realized that he had already lived his entire legacy before I even began mine, I realized that those dreams were never gonna come true until I actually started pursuing them. So that's what I did, and this is where I am right now. So my hope for you is that you take whatever dream you have in your head, whatever inspires your imagination at night and fuels your inspiration in the morning, and make a battle plan to make it happen, and then, Go after it with all your might. Because if you don't, I can promise you from personal experience that one day is never gonna come. You've gotta go grab it. 
So my hope for you is that you take whatever dream is burning in your head, whatever inspires you as you fall asleep and invigorates you when you wake up in the morning. You rebel against the conformity of fear and you chase that dream with everything you have so you can capture it and make it a reality. And I know you can do it too. You know why? Because I could summarize this whole video in one sentence. Really, you got something else to side of you. You got something else to offer. My name is Dominic Syracuse, and remember, this machine kills fascists. And this one shreds their face. Woo, 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 woo.